Hey guys, Harrison101 back at once again for a brand new video for you and welcome to the third episode in the series of Formula 1's Fantastic Four and in this episode we're talking about everybody's favourite okay maybe not but still it's Sebastian Vettel um, I'd argue he is the most polarising driver in the history of Formula 1 there is definitely a paradox and a cult about Sebastian Vettel which always gets people talking and I've probably based more episodes of the online racer around him he's been the world champion for the long time and because people can't stop talking about him and there's always some case of intrigue before I start I just want to say as well thanks to everybody who corrected me on certain facts in the Raikkonen video I got that a little bit messed up when I commentate sometimes things just don't come out right it's part of my Asperger's it's just what's one of the things I've got to cope with really just to clarify, Button and Hamilton was the last World Championship pairing in 2010, apologies. Um, the suspension failure incident was 2005 rather than 2003. And finally, um, his last race win was Australia 2013, not Abu Dhabi 2012. Apologies about that. Thanks. Anywho, let's talk about Sebastian. Um, the thing with Sebastian is this. I'm going to talk about his numbers in a little bit. I'm um, not quite straight away like I normally do with people because Vettel's is, is quite an interesting case. It's a little bit of a different story here. I say this because Raikkonen and Alonso are deeply respected by people, by, by most in Formula 1. Pretty much everybody in Formula 1, actually. I, I've always said I think Alonso is the most popular driver in the sport between him and Hamilton. Raikkonen is universally liked by most people, by about 99% of Formula 1 fans, I'd say. I'd say most fans universally like Raikkonen. Vettel's not in that same league and I think Vettel is kind of hyped up to be the golden boy, the blessed one you could say. Give him the power of opportunity, like Edge, the ultimate opportunist in the WWE you could say. But Vettel debuted as a 19 year old with, um, taught with um, BMW Sauber as a test driver and then as a stand-in for his first Grand Prix in the United States in America, of America in 2007. Um, he, in that race, he became the youngest driver to ever score a point. He came in eighth, scored a point. Um, a record he still holds today, actually. Um, didn't get his first win until that epic race in Italy in 2008 when he joined Toro Rosso. The rain came down in Monza, and somehow, some way, the, the stars came together and the star of Sebastian Vettel was born. Um, and this is through quite a turbulent upbringing as well. I mean, the guy didn't have it easy early on. BMW was a team that had a, lo had a lot of talent like Robert Kubica. Um, Toro Rosso, the car wasn't that great. They were still recovering a lot of the Minardi parts that, that the team had because it, it, it used to be the Minardi team. And they had to clear to get through that phase. The car was failing a lot. It wasn't that strong. It struggled even against the midfield. Um, Vettel crashed into Weber in the senior team at Fuji 2008, which didn't help things. Weber had that hilarious moment where he said the F word live on ITV Sports at about 8 o'clock in the morning during the Japanese Grand Prix in Fuji. Um, that didn't help. But uh, he joined Red Bull in 2009. It was the natural replacement as uh, David Coulthard had um, moved on. And Webber, I think, certainly was the better of the two when Vettel joined in 2009. Um, I think Vettel lacked a lot of polish. The polish that comes with experience, which is what Mark Webber had. And, you know, he joined Red Bull at exactly the right time because Vettel was the guy that, you know, that really, Vettel in combination with Newey finally getting it right, was the guys that took the team over the top. Red Bull finally got their first win in the Chinese Grand Prix of 2009, um, for one. Weber started winning too, finally after about a decade in the sport, Weber had finally started to take himself over the top and start winning as well. But there was awkward moments there too about whether, you know, whether parts were going to Weber or Vettel or 2010, the Turkish Grand Prix where Vettel drove into Weber on the back straight in Turkey and then Vettel blamed Weber and Helmut Marko defended Seb rather than Weber, which caused a whole heap of controversy and blah, blah, blah. We, you know the story. So it took some time things to develop and Vettel didn't have it all his own way for a long time. But, you know, 2010, four guys could have won the title on the last day. Like Kimi Raikkonen in 2007, he controlled his destiny and, and took that win 
um, in Singapore to win the championship while Alonso scored the most spectacular of own goal and Weber couldn't get past him further behind either. Uh, Vitali Petrov, um, the great yellow and black roadblock of Abu Dhabi where it was impossible to pass people back then. Um, uh, Svetl controlled his fate, won the race, won the title, and boom! The first of four. 2011, Red Bull were the strongest car out of the box. 2012, more of a fight, went to the wire with Alonso. 2013, ridiculous in the second half of the year. Maybe it's coming back to bite them now that they spent so much time making 2013 so great. Well, maybe they should have worked on 2014 a bit earlier. Who knows? But um, talking about it now and looking back, if we look at the stats of Sebastian Vettel after just, what, six full seasons in Formula 1, they are absolutely outrageous. Here's a quick rundown in case you didn't know already. Vettel has taken part in 120 Grand Prix. In that time, he has won four consecutive World Championships 2010, 11, 12 and 13. He's only the third driver to win four championships in a row and the fourth driver overall to ever win four. He is fourth on the all-time wins list with 39 career victories, 62 podiums. He is third all-time on the pole position list with 45. Only Senna and Schumacher have more. And he's third on the all-time points list as well. I think with something like 1,480, I think, something along those lines. Um, I've forgotten the number from the top of my head. It's on Wikipedia, but I can't be asked to find it. As my, my man Harrison Whitworth pointed out on, 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 on the um, Alonso video, when it comes to records in Formula 1, the general rule of thumb is if it's the youngest, it belongs to Vettel, and Vettel owns all of those, pretty much all of those youngest Driver 2 records. Youngest guy to, to race of the weekend, youngest guy to start a Grand Prix, uh, youngest point scorer, youngest guy to lead a lap, to score a point. Um, pole position, youngest guy to win, youngest guy to win a world championship, to win a double, a triple, a, a grand slam at 24, etc. If it's an older record, it probably belongs to Schumacher, and most of them do. But he also has a whole heap of more modern records, like and overall records, like the most points in a season, 397, most time, most wins in a season with 13, most in a row with nine consecutively for this very past season that's gone. 15 times on pole, 17 times on a podium in a season, which again is another record. So it's just, it's simply ridiculous the, the accomplishments that Sebastian has made in the sport, especially in such a short amount of time when two of the drivers that are around him in the Elite Four, Alonso and Raikkonen, have been around in Formula One nearly double the time and nearly double the races. So it makes Sebastian's achievements that much greater. Or do they? This is the problem with Sebastian. He's been blessed, you could say, by joining a team that got good at the right time. A team that has incredible money and incredible resources around him. You know, they're owned by a rich billionaire. Red Bull is not even an energy drink anymore. Red Bull is now a marketing campaign. It's a marketing company. They sponsor every damn thing. They own billions. And that is a team that has Adrian Newey. Um, and a lot of teams, you know, I don't think of Adrian Newey is Adrian Newey has designed 10 championship winning cars in his career since he started in the 70s, I think it was, or the 80s, I can't remember which one for sure, which decade it was, I think it was the 70s, but the thing is, is he's designed 10 championship winning cars. I think the difference though with this is that more people doubt Vettel rather than the other guys that won championships in Newey designed cars. Nigel Mansell, Damon Hill, Mika Hakkinen, who won two with McLaren. I don't think people pick their legacies as much as they do with Seb's. Just a thought. Maybe it's the rise of social media and the difference between that and what happened in the 90s when the internet didn't exist. Um, so maybe it's maybe it's the factor of that, 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 that there's a difference between drivers and how the fans are now compared to during the 90s when internet message boards didn't really exist. But there's always been doubts over Sebastian. There's always it's, it's like a thundercloud above his head that walks everywhere it is. It's like the Mario Kart thundercloud in the Wii version, where at any minute the lightning could come down, strike you, and make you look really small. Um, and it's part of the problem of being one 
with the best team in Formula 1 in a sport where the best team tends to win most of the time, pretty much all of the time, and there are guys around him who have been around longer, have bigger fan bases, are more likeable, and have actively tried to win in more than one car compared to Sebastian who so far in his young career has not. Look at a guy like Fernando Alonso. He is a guy who won two world championships with Renault and then changed teams to McLaren in 2007, then changed back to Renault again, then back to Ferrari. Re Alonso likes to align himself with winners. He wants to be the guy who wins in more than one car, like a Prost, a PK, a Lauda, uh, a Schumacher, etc. He wants to kind of build a team around him and define his legacy. I said, this before, I said that before in his video. Lewis Hamilton left his comfort zone of McLaren last year, jumped ship to Mercedes, and seemed to do so at the perfect time. A team, Mercedes, who are no longer the, the fifth wheel, they are the team that is now putting all the right pieces together and are mounting a serious title challenge now. So it's clearly a situation where Hamilton may have jumped ship at the perfect time, a time where the team really seems to be ahead of the curve, especially in 2014 testing. We'll have to wait and see on that. Vettel's had it easy. He's been with the best team in Formula 1, and that naturally will make a lot of people doubt his greatness, especially when, one, he's not popular, given the, the incidents with other teammates like Mark Webber, Multi-21, the fact he's been around drivers who are more popular, like Alonso, Hamilton, Webber, even Button and Raikkonen, for example, maybe even guys like Rosberg and Hulkenberg, who are seemingly more likeable, one, for being attractive, you know, girls watch Formula 1 too, and for not doing things that are dislikable, like team orders, for instance. It doesn't help. Like, when you're with the best team in Formula 1, when it comes to rating your overall ability, sometimes, especially in modern-day Formula 1, it can be a blessing and a curse. Because the blessing is, obviously, he becomes this incredible achiever, but on the downside is, in the court of public opinion, people will start to raise the finger and go, hmm, how good is he really? And I know, I've, I've never seen a sport, or any athlete in a sport, who, who is, which has been a multiple time champion, yet has had their legacy so questioned. I've never seen people doubt Federer's Grand Slams, or Novak Djokovic's or in a sport, or Phil Taylor in darts, or Ronnie O'Sullivan or Stephen Hendry in snooker, guys who have won multiple world championships and have dominated their sport for a period of time, yet people are yet to be convinced. I've never seen that of any other sportsman. It's crazy. It's a, it's a very polarizing and very unique situation, which is why I called this video the Sebastian Vettel, the statistical enigma, because he is a statistical monster, as you know, Formula One 2012 kind of hinted at. You know, he loves to win, loves to get the fastest lap, loves to go purple, loves the numbers, always has. But on the contrast inside of that, it's that he's an enigma because so many people have question marks about is he really this good. Um, maybe it's out of shock, you know, saying that you know, we've, we've not seen a guy come into Formula 1 and dominate like this in quite some time. Maybe it's out of, they like other drivers, like Alonso Hamilton. Maybe it's because they've tried other cars and Vettel's only really been truly successful with Red Bull, despite winning in a Toro Rosso and scoring points with BMW as a 19-year-old. People aren't convinced by that. What does he have to do? You know, does he have to go to another team? beat an elite teammate, because that's another argument people have made against Seb in, over the past years, is that he needs to beat an elite teammate, to, you know, he needs to beat a top guy in the same car to be truly successful. And a lot of, I know a lot of people were upset when they found out that Raikkonen wasn't going to Red Bull last year, and that Alonso wasn't interested, or Hamilton wasn't going to go to Red Bull, even though he tried to in 2011. Um, and I think a lot of people were deflated when they found out that Daniel Ricciardo was going to be in the seat next year because a lot of people were hoping it was going to be an elite teammate and, and have it be someone that can challenge Seb. And, you know, a lot of people think that because Alonso isn't in the best car, he won't win. And, you know, he, he needs to be in that Red Bull so he can win again because the team is that good. So as a result, people doubt Seb. It's just a natural inconvenience of the sport and the fact that Red Bull has been the best team, not dominantly, at times, because 2010 and 2012 were a lot more close edge and a lot more competitive. But overall, Red Bull has been the best team in Formula 1 for four and a half seasons. Ironically, the same four and a half seasons where Sebastian has been so good. 
it's almost coincidental, really, isn't it? And that's the unfortunate thing, especially considering that Newey has been with Red Bull since 2006. So ultimately, when it comes to Sebastian, I think how you define him and define his legacy to date in Formula 101, and I say to date because he's still only 26 years old, people still forget this, he's three years younger than Lewis Hamilton. But how people define his legacy will ultimately come down to a giant set of scales and how much do you tip Seb's own ability, moments like Singapore, Singapore 2013, Abu Dhabi 2012, and you know Brazil 2012, three of his greatest drives, and how he destroyed the field, and now you know Vettel winning, you know, coming in third from the pit lane, or in Brazil where he made a mistake but came back and still won the world title by finishing in the top six, regardless. You know how much do you rate his driver ability? Because again, he has the luxury of being an elite qualifier. Vettel has never won a Grand Prix from anywhere lower than third. You know, when you compare that to a guy like Alonso, who won in Valencia a couple of years ago from 11th on the grid. So again, you know, people have their doubts. You know, people doubt his racecraft because he starts from the higher end of the field so much. He's the, he's the guy that if he takes the lead at turn one or two and will drive off into the distance. It's one of the reasons that Vettel is so good. He can break out a two second lead over the, over the first lap. He's the best, you know, lap one guy in the field when it comes to pure pace. It's just, you know, it's just the unfortunate nature of the beast sometimes, again, like it is in Formula 1. So, as a result, people doubt and doubt and doubt, you know. But, you know, if you rate his ability that highly on the, on the higher end of the scale, it's one thing. If you doubt him because of the car he's in, you have to also bear in mind that people like Jensen Button hugely benefited from being a part of Braun GP2. It's not an uncommon thing where the guy in the best car wins. It's happened 95% of the time in this sport. So as a result, you know, sometimes my attitude has always been, if you're going to criticise Vettel because of his car, you're going to have to do it to a lot more drivers too. Jensen Button, you know, Nicky Lauda, etc, etc. It's happened before, where the best guy who wins gets doubted. If you're on the side of the scale, which means Vettel's only good because of his car, where do you have him all time? Like, is he a top 20 guy even? Even though he's won four championships, he's like, oh, he's got to win, a, he's got to win in a weaker car. And, th you know, and things like that. that. That that side of the coin, that's one side of the coin. That's difficult enough as it is. On the other end, if it is purely his ability and not the Red Bull car in general, comparing him to Mark Webber, who didn't achieve what he could have achieved with that team as a yardstick, because that's the only real true yardstick you have with Sebastian, is, is that Mark Webber was his teammate for such a long time. And people rated Mark quite highly for a while, but then fell off the wagon a little bit towards 2011, 12, 13. So maybe that will make Vettel look weaker as a result as well. So if you have it down to his ability, though, how high would you have him? To me, and this is just my opinion, I know people gave me a hard time when I even mentioned him in the same sentence as Ayrton Senna, but hear me out here. My top five all time is Fangio, Schumacher, Prost third, then Senna, then it gets interesting. Do you go with Clark? Do you go with Graham Hill, Brabham, Stewart, Lauda? I think Vettel is somewhere, in my opinion, in that six to nine range. I think he's a top 10 driver of all time, and I think he deserves to be in the conversation with Ayrton. I never said he was better, I'm not even saying he's on the same league, I'm saying he's much closer than I think people would give him credit for. That's my opinion, and I know people are going to pan me for it, but hey, that's just my honest take on the thing. But it's my point is, is that it's it all comes down to how you rate and how you scale up the equation of how good is the car compared to how good he is. And it's something that's going to be different for everybody who watches and everybody who has an opinion on Seb. So, if you're you, how do you rate him? Is he the best driver in the field right now? Are you more of an Alonso or Hamilton guy? How about Raikkonen? You know, do you think it's all on him? Is it a large degree down to his car? Let me know. And where do you have him all time? That's interesting thing I want to know as well. That's, that, that's my take. I think he's somewhere in the 6-9 to nine range. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear you guys take as ever, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope it's the best Sebastian Vettel video I've made to date. God, I'm really proud of this one, and I hope I hope you guys appreciated it as much as I did making it. Next up, and the final episode, or is it, 
Lewis Hamilton. I'll be talking about him again after his recent Hamilton conundrum video and how I have him in the grand scheme of things in Formula 1. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you enjoyed, and I'll catch you guys for Hamilton's later in the week. I've been Harrison101. Thank you very much for watching, and sayonara.